If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 20 today. We're continuing in the parables of Jesus. As you're turning to Matthew chapter 20, I hope you have a Bible in your hand. If you don't, please use one of those ones under the chairs in those racks. We want everybody to have God's Word in their hand because we want everybody to get God's Word in their hearts. In their hearts. Amen. <clears throat> in their hearts. Matthew chapter 20 today. Let's say a couple things as you're turning to Matthew chapter 20. Uh, we have a lot of people that come into our service uh, who are seeking the Lord. Some of them don't even know they're seeking the Lord, but they're seeking the Lord. And, and a lot of people have some difficult issues that they're trying to overcome. And I just appreciate everybody here who loves everybody who comes through our doors uh, because we want people here who are seeking the Lord. Amen. And for those of us who have found him, we pray for them we encourage them and we support them. Uh, hey, so Matthew chapter 20, this is the parable of the first and the last. Sometimes it's called the parable of the, the workers in the vineyard. Most people call it the parable of the first and the last. Uh, <clears throat> this is one of the longest parables that we're going to look at, just this one today in Matthew chapter 20. But I got to tell you this before we start, uh, just by way of introduction here, uh, I locked myself out of the church this week. I've, I've done that. I'm looking back over, you know, it'll be 13 years that uh, my wife and I have been here in uh, Thanksgiving. And so in 13 years, I've locked myself out three times. I think that's pretty good. I, I think that's not bad. Because it's not like at your house where you shut the door, it's not locked. I mean, when you shut the door, these are locked, except for Sundays and Wednesdays, you know, and it's automatic. And so I, I think that's not bad, but, uh, and this one was kind of good. I, I was in the blessing closet. I was taking, somebody dropped something off, took it in the blessing closet. And then maybe you've done this with your car door or something where you hear that door click and you're just like, oh, I am locked out. Uh, so I was, but I was locked into the blessing closet and they got some cool stuff in there. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, I could do some shopping. They've got snacks. Somebody told me they had snacks. I don't know that for, you know, that because I try, tried them or anything. Somebody told me they have snacks. I'm just saying. But uh, anyway, but they have this combination, you know, and I remember blessed Jackie Romer, who's with Jesus right now. Praise the Lord. Way better off than any of us. Hallelujah. But she showed me that when they put that in. I think Keith put that in. And uh, so this is the combination. And I can't remember the combination, but she... She showed it to me, and he, and he got to hit a button, and then hit the combination, and then hit a different button, and then there's lots of buttons, and, I, and I'm trying everything. You know, I, I can go out of the blessing closet, but then I'm out of the whole building, but that's the only possible way in without my key, and I'm just trying everything, 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 I can't remember it. And so I just pray, because that's what we do, amen? Difficult times, we pray. I'm like, God, please help me. I don't want to walk probably almost more than half a mile down the street to the nearest person with the key who might not even be there, and then I'll have to walk further, and, and there's no pay phones anymore. You know, that was kind of, I miss the pay phones. <clears throat> so anyway, I tried again, and it works perfectly. It turns green, ring, it opens up, I'm like, oh. I'm like, thank you, thank you, Lord. And that's what the Lord does sometimes. Are you with me? Sometimes, I mean, if that's his will, boom, you got it. <clears throat> Big time yes. I was like, yes. But sometimes you pray and it's no. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is wait, right? Uh, one of the other times I told you right after it happened a few years ago, the worst thing time when I locked myself out was when I was filling up the baptistry and the water was running and I locked myself out. You know, you just hear that click. It's like, and the water is running and I'm getting visions of it just coming over and just ruining things. And so I just took off running to the nearest house of somebody who I knew had a key I just ran over there, if you remember my little story, and nobody was there. I take a breath, I'm like, Lord help me. Now I gotta run uh, almost a mile now to the next person who might have a key, I start running. Uh, but a na there was a neighbor there, he saw me running, and he realized I didn't have running clothes on, I didn't have my spandex on, you know. 
So he's like, something's wrong. I see that guy. He doesn't look like he should be running right now. Something's wrong. And he gave me a ride over to the church. He actually showed me how to, he goes, there's got to be a water shutoff valve, you know. And I'm like, I don't know these things. And we found it and shut the water off. Crisis averted. He gave me a ride. So that was a kind of a weight. It was like a no, a weight thing. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because one of the main lessons that we learn from this parable is we have to trust God. And in our prayers, in our daily life, we have to trust God with those prayers. We have to trust that he knows more than us, that his will is perfect, that all things do really, honestly, truly work together for good to them that love the Lord and are calling to, our, to his purpose. We've got to believe that. And we've got to trust God. And so that's the, one of the main uh, principles and lessons in this parable that we're going to look at today. And I want you to th be thinking about that, trusting God because he is trustworthy because he loves us and because he's trustworthy as we go down through this. So now let's look at it. Matthew chapter 20, verse 1. This is the parable of the first and the last. So let's read it. Uh, follow along with me. This is Jesus speaking. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. So get that picture in your head. Uh, you have someone who owns this vineyard, hires some workers for the vineyard, and he goes away. Verse number two, now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. So he's there in the morning and uh, he gets the workers early in the morning and he, they agree on what they're going to get paid for the whole day. Good, I agree to this, this is what I'll pay, go work. They start working. Now verse three, he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. So they didn't agree on, a, on the wages here. He just said, whatever's right, you know, that's what I'm going to give you. So they said, okay. And they went. Verse number five. Again, he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, and he did likewise. Uh, then, verse number six, he did what probably none of us would do. With about an hour left in the day, he goes out. He found some other people standing idle. He says, why have you been standing idle here all day? And they says, duh, nobody's hired us, okay? Uh, and he says, well, go into my vineyard and I'll pay you whatever is right. And so they do. <coughs> so verse number eight, when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, okay, call the laborers and give them their wages beginning with the last to the first. Verse number nine. When those came who were hired about the 11th hour, they each received a denarius. And we'll get into that in a minute. But when the first came, they supposed they're going to receive more. But they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner. And they said what a lot of us would have said. Hey, these last guys only worked one hour. You made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered in verse 13 and said to them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. And I wish to give this last man the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? Verse number 16, the last verse in this parable. The last will be first and the first last. For many are called and few are chosen. Let's all pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, open the eyes of our hearts because we want to see you. Lord, help us to see you in this parable. Open the ears of our hearing, Lord, in our hearts and in our minds because we want to hear from you today. Speak loud and clear. And Lord, help us to take what we hear from you and apply it to our daily lives. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. I'm going to give you the main point today, three main parable points. Number one, God is the owner and we are the managers. God is the owner and we are the managers. In this parable, God was the landowner and we're the laborers. In this life, God is the owner, we're the managers. This is one of the most important things in life to understand. When we get this settled in our hearts, everything else flows. 
if we don't have this settled in our hearts, it, it can be a bumpy ride and we might be bumping into God, bumping into his will. Psalm 89 11 says this, Psalms 89 11, the heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, the world in all its fullness. You have founded them, you have created them. Everything is the Lord, and most of us understand this truth. Most of us have embraced this truth, but this morning, are you sitting here today where you have not embraced that truth, where God is the owner? That's why he says, this is like the kingdom of heaven, a land owner, right? He's the owner, we're the laborers. I want to give you some points under uh, point number one, little ABC under number one. Uh, letter A, if we have not embraced this truth, we will be going against God at every turn. Why? Because there's only one God, there's only one owner, there's only one person in charge, and it's not me, and it's not you. Do we get that? Do we get that? Our Western culture <clears throat> does not agree with that. Our Western culture is constantly pounding us with, you deserve everything, you deserve more, uh, you are, it's all about you. Everything, every, every advertisement we get because they're after money, they don't really care about us, is saying, I'm, I'm great, I'm in charge, I deserve this, I deserve that. Every, we're bombarded with that from birth. And it affects us. God says in his word, guess what? It's all about me. <laughs> it's all about me, God says, right? It's not all about us. And when we come in line with that, man, that's when life just flows. Life flows because there's only one God, there's only one owner. Look back at verse number one of our text that we just read. The kingdom of heaven is like a land owner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for whose vineyard? Who's his? His vineyard, right? When we have that truth settled, everything else will flow. Letter B this morning as managers, that's what I like to call us as managers. In this parable, it's laborers. But we're here to manage the things that God has given us, our lives, uh, and more. And let her be, as managers, we give God our time, our talent, and our tithe. As managers, we give God our time, our talent, and our tithe. So let's go each in, uh, through each one of these. Our time is the most invi valuable thing we have. It's the most important thing we have because we can't get it back. I mean, once it's gone, it's gone. The last five minutes, we'll never get back. The last hour, this morning, the morning's still good until noon, <laughs> but it's almost, that's almost it, right? Yesterday's gone, can't get it back. Our time is more valuable than anything. And <clears throat> so that's why we want to give God the most valuable part of our life and our time and because it's, a, it's all about our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Time spent with Jesus is the best investment of our life. Time spent with Jesus is the best investment of our life. Because it's about a relationship with God. How are we going to build a relationship with a person if we don't spend time with them? We can't. We can't. We have to spend time in a relationship, and that's what we have with Jesus Christ. My first, uh, I was remembering my first uh, seven months here. Uh, started on the Sunday after Thanksgiving. This, this coming Thanksgiving will be 13 years, but the first seven months, my family uh, didn't come over with me because my wife was still teaching. My kids were still in the school over there. Didn't want to interrupt their school year. <clears throat> so... Uh, they stayed there. I came over here, lived in various and a sundry of your houses, uh, several of you. Paul was Paul and Lynn, gracious enough to have me there. And uh, let's see, who else? Where was, uh, David Beckley Kaplinger. I was in their house a little bit. Uh, so, by the way, Paul and Lynn stocked their fridge really well. I just want to say, <laughs> just so you know, if you ever need a place to go. Uh, I gained weight, I think, at their house, but... But that was really hard, and I remember I would come over here on Saturday night and, you know, for Sunday morning and spend the night, and then I'd be here Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Thursday I would go home to see my wife and children. <clears throat> for 
Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you know, and so that's what I did for those seven months, and that was really hard. Some of you have done that. Have had, you've had to do that for a job or something. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's hard. Why? Because you, you're not spending the time you want to spend with the ones you love that you normally see every single day. And man, that was, that was difficult. How difficult should it be if we don't spend time with God? We should miss that, right? We should miss that. If we go two or three days and we really haven't spent some time with the Lord, if we don't miss that, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Every single day to get into his word, to have time with him, lets him know that we put him first and we love him and we want that relationship to get better. Also, our talents. Are we using our talents for the Lord's honor and glory? God gives us talents and gifts to all of us to be used. A lot of times we use it for uh, our income, for our, our work, uh, <clears throat> but it's also... Uh, not just to make money, but to provide for our needs, to bless others, and for the Lord's honor and glory. What do we do when we work, and how do we do it, and who do we work for? I want to read to you Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Love this passage. Some of you know it. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Whatever you do, do it heartily. That just literally means with all your heart. As to who? As to the Lord, not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive a reward of inheritance, for you serve the Lord, Jesus Christ. Please catch this. One great way to use your talents is doing something anonymously, something no one notices, doing it for the Lord that nobody sees. I know a lot of you, I think a lot of you do that. I, I, I sense that. The Lord sees and the Lord knows. And when we do something without looking for credit, when we do something and nobody knows and we don't tell anybody, we used to <clears throat> joke around, if you told somebody, you'd, you'd, lose the, you'd lose some jewels out of your crown there. Oh, you, told, you told somebody. I told somebody I was in the kitchen cleaning out their fridge. I just lost, my, lost it. Just lost that reward that I was going to have. I should have not said anything, Right? Why is that? Because man, that's our, our gifts and talents, when we do them for the Lord, it, it just, it's, it goes to eternity. It speaks to eternity. And when we do them anonymously, man, the Lord sees it and he knows we're not doing it so people can see us to get credit. We're, at, we're really doing it for him. We do everything for him, but especially when we do things that nobody sees we know is for the Lord and he sees that, he rewards that. I wanna to get to tithes as laborers in the labor, uh, laborers in the landowner's vineyard. It's crucial that we give him our tithe. Most of you understand our tithe is the first 10% of what we receive. And most of you I'm sure give your tithe. I wanna to read to you Malachi 3, eight through 10. This is a powerful scripture in Malachi 3, 8 through 10, because I, most of us never think of it this way, but verse number 8, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. This is God speaking to the people through the prophet Malachi. God says, but I say to you, but you say, in what way have we robbed you? And God says, in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you've robbed me. Even this whole nation, he's speaking to the nation of Israel. And what does he say to do in verse number 10? Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this. Try me now in this, says the Lord. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Do we believe God's word? Do we? Say amen if you believe God's word. Amen. amen. We know that tithing begins with the first 10%. That's, our, that's the standard God gives us. Somebody might say, well, that's Old Testament. We're living in the New Testament. Well, if you know the New Testament, God wants 100% in the New Testament. So just saying. Our all, what did he tell the rich young ruler? Sell everything you have and give that money to the poor. And then come follow me. Mm, mm. 
So as I said, tithing begins with the first 10%. And then it goes to offerings. Offerings, most of you know this. This is giving above your tithe and offering, like a lot of you give to the Great Commission Fund or you give to the Benevolent Fund, things like that. And then the greatest giving is sacrificial giving. That's giving out of need when it's hard to give. That's not giving out of extra. You remember the story of the widow's mite and Jesus was watching people put money in and she probably put in the least amount of money. But Jesus didn't say anything about anybody else's giving except her. She said she gave the most because it was out of her need that she gave. Listen, we don't need to pray about giving our tithe, giving what the, to, to the owner what he deserves. This is our first fruits of showing God that he's really first in our life, that we belong to him, that our finances belong to him. But pray about offerings and sacrificial giving. I believe a lot of you do. And he'll speak to your heart and show you where he wants you to give. Because when we give, we receive. We always receive more when we give. Amen? And God wants us to have that picture of our life being a river where he blesses us and we bless others. A flow, not a hold up, not like a reservoir where it's all held up. Because God is so good, we want to let everybody know his goodness. I want to give you letter C, and this is one we touched on at the beginning. We can trust the owner because he loves us more than anyone loves us. Amen? Do you believe that? We can trust the owner. Why? Well, he's trustworthy, of course. But because he loves us. He loves us way more than anyone loves us. That's, there's a reason why John 3.16 3, is the most popular Bible verse and that one that so many people know. It's all about his love for us. Say it with me if you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen? Amen? Amen. It's all about his love, and that's why we can trust him. Let me tell you this very quickly. I've told you some stories about my dad, my dad passing away last year. But my dad was hard on me. He was strict on me. I'll just say it like this. Jesus had more fun than me. That's all I'm going to say. <clears throat> I mean, it was just that way. And no, no movies, man. Movies, uh-uh. Never went to a movie until I got in college. <clears throat> uh, no dances. You know, the school has dances. Prom, homecoming, all that stuff. Nope, nope, nope. And there were a lot more no's, but those were the main ones. Uh, but I'm, I want to say this. Uh, number one, I've told you before, uh, as I look back, now that I'm older and more mature, I can look back and I can say truthfully, I needed my dad to be hard on me. I needed that right there. Some people don't. You know, maybe you didn't. I did. I would have been, whew, I probably would not be here if he was not strict with me and hard on me. I probably would not be here. I don't think I would. Who knows where? I would either be dead or in jail. That's just the way my little personality went. And... But because of that, I, he was exactly who I needed. But as we're talking about love and trusting God, I never resented my dad for being strict on me and hard on me because I knew how much he loved me. And it was without question. He, he didn't even have to say it. He said it a few times. He wasn't big on, you know, one of those, I love you every day. I heard it a few times. But I knew through the way he treated me the rest of the time. I mean, taking me fishing, going to all my games, <clears throat> uh, even when I wasn't playing. I remember this one year, I didn't play hardly at all. In the eighth grade was a junior high football team with eighth and ninth graders. And the ninth graders were amazing. And they, I played on that team, but I didn't play much that year at all. My dad came to every single game. And me just not playing. Uh, I remember then moving up to Pennsylvania, didn't know anybody. Uh, I get on the football team, and I'm not playing much. I played on the kickoff team, and we rarely scored, so I played once every game. <laughs> you know, you kick off after you score. If you don't score much, <clears throat> you get that one kickoff. Uh, 
And about the fourth or fifth game, we were losing and getting killed by some team. It was actually in State College, Pennsylvania, where Penn State is. And their high school team wore the same outfits at Penn State. And they looked huge. And they looked just like we were playing the college team. And we were getting crushed. And it was pouring down rain. My mom and dad are sitting in the stands. It's a cold fall night in Pennsylvania, pouring down rain. And we're in the locker room at halftime. We come out. And I see my mom and dad, and they wave. They're leaving. They're like, this is, I just can't take it anymore. <laughs> They're leaving, but they didn't know at halftime, the coach was so mad at all the starters. You know, he picked a couple of us, benched guys. He's like, get in there. I want you to get in there. These guys are playing terrible. You can't play any worse than them. Get in there. <laughs> and so, uh, so I started right away playing, playing linebacker, playing on defense, and and I remember them telling me this story later. As they're on their way out to the parking lot, they heard over the PA system, Richter on the tackle. And they're like, what? He's, he's playing. And they went back in, in the pouring rain. If you have just, you know when people love you, right? You know when people love you. And even though people aren't perfect, yeah, right. People, even up, whether it's parents or whether it's other family, whether it's friends, you know who loves you. Jesus loves you. This I know. Why? For the, for the Bible tells me so. That should be a Bible verse, should it not? But it's a nice little song that will, that most of us know. But because He loves us, what we can trust Him. Even when he says sometimes no. Did any of you have parents that sometimes said no? Man, that's all I heard. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> Nobody had more no's than I did. But guess what? I knew they loved me. I knew they loved me. I didn't resent that. And I appreciate it now as I look back. That's with God, please trust him. Trust him because he loves you more than anyone in your life will ever love you. Hey, look back at verse number eight this morning in Matthew chapter 20. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, call the laborers, give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. When those came who were hired about the 11th hour, they received a denarius. A denarius in Jesus' day was typically a day's wage. That was what it, what it was worth. So today, it, it depends on what you make, right? If you made $100 a day, that would be a denarius. That was like the, the day's wage. <clears throat> it, it, was a good, it was a good number. It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't minimum wage. It was a good, a good wage for a day. Uh, go back to verse number 10. But when the first came, they supposed they would receive more. As most of us would probably think, you see that guy that was there for an hour and he got a whole day's wage for an hour, but they received their denarius. Verse 11, and they complained about it. Verse 12, the owner says this, listen, uh, I'm sorry, they said, uh, these last men only worked an hour. You made them equal with us. And again, this, this denarius was a good, a good uh, amount of money. And, and please hear me, we need to understand the landowner was, landowner was generous. He decided to pay everybody in areas. You work one hour, I'm going to give you a day's wage. You work three hours, I'll give you a whole day's wage. You work the whole day, you agreed to it, right? You agreed to it in the morning. You want to get a denarius? A day? Yeah, okay. So you agreed to that. I want to give you parable point number two. May we understand God's generosity to all and be thankful. Because God is generous to all. Do you know where God's generosity to all is on full display? It is in his long-awaited return. Why, why is he still waiting? We are all ready. Do I hear an amen? amen. Do I hear an amen? amen? We are ready. I can't believe sometimes when you think about it, we're in 2024. I remember watching that movie 1999 in the 80s thinking we'll never make it to that you know and then the y2k thing for 2000 i was like i mean 2024 closing in on 2012 and, and you think why why is god away because of his generous mercy 
He is not willing that any should perish. He, he cannot wait. He wants to wait till that last person hears and has a chance. And even though we want him to come yesterday, he is generous in his mercy to everybody. We don't want to be like Jonah and get mad at God because he's so merciful and good to everyone, even people who don't believe in him. We don't want to be like that. God is generous and God is merciful. Think about God's mercy in your own life, his generous forgiveness, his generous mercy in your own life, his generous goodness in your own life. Think about times where we didn't get what we really deserved from God. Think about times where we got what we deserved. Then think about times where we got good, so much good from the Lord, and we didn't deserve that. God is generous, and we need to be thankful. Then this parable, the owner wants to bless everyone. Jesus is saying loud and clear, I want each and every person to have an eternal reward, an eternal home, an eternal life with me in heaven forever. Everyone. Everyone. And it is a great blessing when we receive the Lord when we're young or when we receive the Lord uh, when we're kind of young or you know, the longer we can be with the Lord and have that relationship with him, it's such a blessing. Because I've met several people who, who gave their life to the Lord t- toward the very end. Prayed with a, a young lady in her 40s right before she was going into a surgery. It was 50-50 whether she would make it out alive. And she genuinely gave her life to the Lord. It wasn't like, well, I better do this just to be safe. I spent some time with her two days, just in the evenings. And even in those two days, her husband was like, she is totally different. She really did this. She didn't do this, you know, just, I oh, better do this to be safe. She was like, why didn't I do this sooner? Are you with me? Are you with me? Why didn't I do this sooner? She passed away in the surgery. Never saw her again. But she made it. She's there. She was at the 11th hour of her life. She's there. Can't wait to see her again. But what was she thinking? Man, I wish I'd have done that sooner, of course. Because relationship with God, it doesn't get any better in life than a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. To have him with us, amen? To have him with us every day. So we want to understand God's generosity and be thankful for it. I want to give you two things. May we never resent or be jealous of God's generosity with others. I mean, let's admit it. That's hard sometimes, right? I mean, man, I see some, I see some amazing boats just, and I'm just like, mm, mm, mm. I'm a water purr. I love the water. I've, I've had a couple old boats. Some of you might remember my uh, $300 yacht that I used to have. That was fun. But, you know, I love boats. And, man, you see a nice boat. Oh, some of these boats. Don't get me going on these boats. Like, where? Wow. Do you need five motors? Do you really need five motors? Do you need a boat that's 50 feet long? But, man, if, you got the, if I had the money, I'd have one. Right? But, you know, you see some stuff like that. We, man, if they worked hard and earned that money, good for them. I mean, we don't want to be jealous. God is generous to everyone. God blesses everyone in some ways. And we don't want to be jealous. We don't want to resent that. We always want to be thankful and grateful for God's generosity to, to us. Because whether we have money or not, we have things in our heart and life that are worth so much more than any amount of money could ever be. Amen? Amen. Hey, I want to draw our thoughts to a close. We'll get to, uh, I want to get to the last verse. Would you go to the last verse there, verse 16 in Matthew chapter 20? The last will be first and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. So this is really interesting here. We, uh, we have a couple of original manuscripts, and I don't want to get 
do deep in these weeds, these are really good weeds, but if you study this, uh, we have two original manuscripts that, and, and one of them has this last phrase, for many are called but few are chosen in it, and one does not. And so, so some translations, like I'm, I preach out of New King James, uh, so New King James has many are called and few are chosen, the King James has it, some other translations you might not have that, and they just don't because one of the original ones has it and one doesn't. It's so amazing that we have these original documents that Matthew wrote on. I mean, it's just amazing to think about that, that these people who were inspired by God writing his word, and we have that that we can look at and, and, and translate into every language in the world in. But Jesus uses this phrase again in Matthew twenty two fourteen exactly the same way. Many are called, but few are chosen. And it's a difficult saying of Jesus to wrap our minds around. We know we are chosen as believers by God. We know that he has chosen us. Why? Because Jesus says it in John fifteen sixteen. John fifteen sixteen. Jesus says, you did not choose me, I chose you. Amen? Amen. John 15, 16. Jesus tells us. It's pretty black and white. You didn't choose me. I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. But then we also know that we have this free will. And we, and we have to accept God's invitation to us. He stands at the door and knocks. But we have to open the door and let him in. So we have this paradox, right? God has chosen us. Before the foundation of the world. Wow. Think about that. That he knew you. He formed each one of us in our mother's womb. Amen. He chose us. Before we were even born. But then he gives us a free will. He gives us a free will. And if we want to come to him. We've got to open that door. And accept his invitation. I like to think of it as. Before we were born. As we were uh, being formed in our mother's womb, in his foreknowledge, he knew who would choose him and who wouldn't. And so he predestined us and made us in a wonderful, a wonderful, amazing plan for our lives with him. I love Jeremiah 29, 11. A lot of you are familiar with that, I'm sure. For I know, God says through the prophet Jeremiah to us, I know the plans and the thoughts that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans and thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Parable point number three. We want to live each day worthy of being chosen by God. Amen. We want to live each day worthy of being chosen by God. My favorite story of being chosen is actually one of not being chosen. Uh, in elementary school, Richmond, Virginia, concrete jungle, that's where we were. We all lived in these houses. We were in a parsonage the church owned. Uh, but, but, but all these houses on, the, on these blocks just were almost identical. These brick two-story buildings with a basement, about 10 feet from each other. Choo, 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 choo. Concrete steps, little tiny yard. So we, we played in the street. We were just in the street. We played street ball, whatever was, if it was, if there was snow on the street, we played hockey. If there wasn't, we played tag football. We played kickball. We played baseball. We were in the street. We were like six or eight blocks from the elementary school. So I would walk to elementary school back in the day when you could do that. <laughs> and that was not a problem. And our, our school was even uh, concrete, uh, blacktop, no grass. Not one blade of grass. It's all blacktop. Uh, so, you know, you grow up a little hard. Because <laughs> if you fall, it's not the grass. But I just remember all the bus kids uh, would get there like 30 minutes early. They'd play a basketball game. And they would pick teams. And it was a big deal. And when I would get there five minutes, you know, uh, before school starts, they'd all be talking about it. And it was like a big deal. And I thought, you know, one day I'm going to get there early because I want to play in that game. Because hundreds of kids would gather around and watch this basketball game. And so I went early. 
and they, and I, they picked teams, you know, so they got the two best players, and they picked teams, and, you know, everybody's, you know, hey, pick me, pick me, pick me. They get all the way down to the last person, and they're looking at me and this one other guy. Talk about, woof, I don't, you know, and I'm trying to stand there looking. I'm a little taller than him, so I feel a little bit good. And there's one guy on his left that says, yeah, pick, pick Richter. He's taller. He'll get rebounds. But then there's a guy on his right. No, pick this other guy. He's faster. He could probably dribble better. And the guy just... For the longest time, it probably wasn't long, but in elementary school, it seemed like a long time. And he picked the other guy. And he didn't pick me. And so they go play, and now I'm just a spectator. And man, it's, it's, like, a, it's like an arena, man. There's hundreds of kids, and they're clapping and cheering and at whoever's doing good and all this stuff. And we go in. And man, never forgot that. I never went back either. I'm like, I'm not getting up 30 minutes early for that. You know, but guess what? Jesus looks at each one of us and says, I choose you. 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 Every one of us. He says, I choose you. Wow. Never lose the awe of being chosen. And may we live each day worthy of that. Worthy of that. That he has chosen us that he knows our name, that he knew us when we were, before we were born, that he formed us, that he chose us. Live each day worthy of being chosen. Jesus has looked at you and me and said, I choose you. Let's walk each day in a way that is worthy of being chosen by God. Let's make him glad he chose us, amen? Make him glad he chose you. Let's make him proud, make him pleased, with our daily life, pleased that he chose us. Let's pray together before we end our service today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to open it up to anyone this morning who has not received Jesus Christ. If you are here today, I want you to know God has looked at you and chosen you. He is standing at the door of your heart, God's word says, and he's knocking. And he wants you to open that door so he can say, I chose you. <laughs> Join my team. He wants to let you on his team. If you've never accepted Jesus in your heart, if you've never asked him to forgive you for your sins, to come and live in your heart, don't go a minute longer. You are missing out on the greatest relationship you'll ever have, the relationship with Jesus Christ. So I want to pray for you before we end our service. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Nobody's looking around. This is just between you and God and me so I can pray for you. So if that's you this morning, just raise your hand. And by raising your hand, you're saying, Pastor Tim, please pray for me as I want to accept Jesus' invitation. Amen. Praise the Lord. Anybody else before we go any further? Say, Pastor Tim, pray for me. I want to open that door and accept Jesus' invitation as he's chosen me. Let's all pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for the privilege of our lifetime that you have chosen us. Help us, Lord, to live worthy of our calling and of our choosing. We can't do it on our own, but Lord, we know that with you, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Strengthen us, Lord, to live for you each day. And we will give you all the praise and the honor and the glory. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Thank you for coming. Go in peace. God bless you.